Firstly, I just want to congratulate the committee on this, the 13th annual Sean McDermott Summer School. It's a great achievement to have had so many years of success. And I suppose it's a testament of the committee's commitment and ability that even last year in the grips of the early days of COVID-19, that they were able to quickly adapt to an online event. Uh, and lucky for us, we didn't know then what we know now, and we're still very much in the grips of COVID-19, and we're here virtually again this year. Um, I remember last year over the course of your speakers, it was noted how apt it was that the committee had selected the theme of health and healthcare, uh, and that this theme of health had eerily been selected uh, many months, months before we even had heard of COVID-19. Uh, so you've foreseen the future, a bit like a premonition, and hopefully it was a once-off premonition with this theme being the War of Independence. Um, I've had the pleasure to attend the summer school in person for many years in my previous life as an elected member of Leitrim County Council. And while it is wonderful uh, to be invited to speak this year, I knowing firsthand uh, the caliber of previous speakers, I have to say I was somewhat surprised by the invite, as I am not a historian by any measure, uh, nor do I have any uh, expertise in the period of 1919 to 21. And when I said as much to Regina and added, unless you can qualify me through my grandfather's uh, participation in the 1921 tragedy at Selton Hill. And so it was at that point uh, that I walked myself in in front of you all tonight. So my expertise in this period is not expertise, unless you count an inheritance expertise. But thank you to Regina and the committee for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, when I wrote my summary for the brochure, I chose the quote uh, by my grandfather, uh, which he made on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Selton Hill. Uh, I wasn't actually born for it. Uh, but my grandfather said, we never thought the day would come when we would see the end of it. And I suppose that statement just felt so relevant when reflecting, because it's a statement that we've all been hearing versions of so much in the last year because of the pandemic. Uh, everyone you meet or everywhere you go, although we're not supposed to be meeting anybody or going anywhere, um, but at those rare uh, shopping trips, uh, everywhere you meet, you hear people saying, when will this be over or will we ever see the end of it? But actually, when I sat down to write about Selton Hill, reflecting back, you know, 100 years and with my mindset very much in today's world, uh, until COVID-19, I wasn't really conscious of how close the pandemic the last pandemic, that being the Spanish flu, I wasn't really conscious of how close that was to the War of Independence. And, you know, because of that pandemic, what our ancestors and their communities had already been through on top of the political climate uh, of the time, you know, and I've read accounts in the Duke of Schools projects uh, from the 1930s. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's a wonderful online resource to have um, where children sat down with older people in their communities and recorded uh, the history of their areas but some of the school children from our locality noticed that hundreds died and whole families were wiped out uh, during that pandemic. As I also said at the beginning this is my inherited experience. Uh, I was four when my grandfather died and while I remember sitting on his knee or him trying to catch me when I'd be racing by him uh, the realization of something more than you know, just that of a smiling grandparent probably manifested uh, from the time of his passing. And I remember the full military honours at his graveside and the shots were deafening and terrifying. Uh, and I suspect that's where I began to know about the tragic tale of young lives lost at Selton Hill in March 1921. And that my grandfather, Patrick Guckin, or Paddy, as we called him, was one of the five survivors um, from the 11-man flying column who arrived at Selton Hill on a cold, cold March morning. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Leitrim, Selton Hill is located in Gorva. Uh, it's situated on the R202, which is the main uh, Mohol to Ballinamore Road in the south of the county. And it's worth noting, uh, according to Dr. Porrick McGarty in his recently published book, uh, Leitrim, the Irish Revolution, 1912 to 23, he says the actual first meetings of volunteers took place in Gorva, so the same area uh, in August 1918. Uh, and we can see from a number of Leitrim Common Naman members' statements in the Bureau of Military Archives, another amazing online resource to have, um, 
we can see that their meetings, their brigade meetings usually were held at Gorva too. So Selton Hill was in an important location in the south of the county. So in early 1921, the situation in Leitrim reflected, I suppose, the national situation. Uh, the passing of the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act brought the arrival of the auxiliaries in August 1920. And the British authorities had resorted to a range of ruthless actions and coercive measures, including internment, use of court martials, military tribunals, and the imposition of curfews. And Leitrim people suffered beatings, burnings and very heavy handed uh, measures of social control. And there was a large number and wide ranging amount of rampages destroying business premises, private homes, private farms and community halls. And I've heard the aforementioned Dr. McGarty say on many occasions that from his extensive research, the reprisals by the Crown forces in Leitrim were significantly out of proportion with the extent of the IRA's activity. So my grandfather Paddy had joined volunteers in 1918 and by March 1921 he had been on the run a number of months like many of his colleagues. Uh, we know that prior to March 1921 among a number of other events he had been involved in one raid for arms uh, at a Protestant farmer's house or relieving them of their arms, as he referred to it. And although he was wearing a mask like his colleagues, when they were leaving the house, the Protestant farmer said, I'd know you anywhere but Gukin, uh, which is how our family name was distinguished by the many Gukin families in Leitrim. We were the Buck Gukins. Of course, we've got a lot taller since then, so we're no longer called Butts. Uh, but we also know uh, from another survivor from the event at Selton Hill, and that is Bernie Sweeney. And we can see in his witness statement in the military archives that it was in December 1920 that the active service unit or flying column came into existence. And he says, and I quote, a number of the lads who were on the run had come together for companionship and also for safety reasons, and we were staying in one district. So in February 1921, Sean Connolly, an IRA General Headquarters staff officer uh, and a leader of the North Longford Brigade, came to Leitrim. Um, he was sent by General Headquarters to Roscommon first and then to Leitrim to help with organising. And when Sean Connolly arrived in Leitrim, he divided the active service unit into two units. One flying column he led himself and the other one was led by a local man. Sean Mitchell from Mohol. So it's an important element to the events at Selton Hill on the 11th of March to know the details of what happened the week before at a very different event, but not too far away from Selton Hill, and that was at Shamor. So Shamor is located approximately nine kilometres north of Carrick and Shannon. Uh, you might be familiar with the illuminated cross. Uh, on the top of the hill. It's a very large hill just outside Carrick and Shannon. At night time, the cross is illuminated. It's a large cross and the illumination is quite high in the sky. And people who are unfamiliar with the area often think they're seeing an apparition when traveling on the, on the Manor Hamilton Road. But Chamor is known as the Hill of Fairies and is long steeped in mythology. And actually, when I was reading some of the Duke of Schools project files, uh, I noted one participant said, it is said that Bin McCool and his men are asleep in a cave, Shamor, awaiting to be called to free Ireland. So the week before events uh, at Selton Hill on the 4th of March, rumours had been circulating the Carrick and Shannon area that the British Crown forces were going to raid the first Friday mass at Gower Church because they believed that a number of the volunteers would be in attendance. And Gower Church is located very near the foot of Shamor. So this is actually Gower Church today, which is very much as it would have been uh, in 1921. And to the left of that picture, uh, you can see just kind of the slope down from Selton Hill. So the Crown Forces, mostly military members of the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiment, they raided the mass and they searched all the people coming out from the church, but they didn't bind any volunteers. And local stories say they absolutely ransacked Sacristy as well. But when they were returning to Carrick and Shannon, Sean Mitchell and his flying column of Charlie McGoohan, Michael Gagan, Joan Angle, Matthew Boylan, Thomas O'Reilly, Michael Martin, 
and Harry McEwan, McEwan were well hidden and ready in position on the Crown Force's return route. So the Crown Forces were fired upon as soon as they came into the range of Sean Mitchell's flying column. And the column of volunteers only had a very limited supply of ammunition, so the engagement was short, but the British Crown Forces suffered numerous casualties and one fatality, a commanding officer, Lieutenant Wilson. The volunteers didn't suffer any casualties. And I've often been told by others that my grandfather was at Shamor that morning, located on an alternative potential return route for the Crown Forces. And since the release of the military archives, uh, he actually confirms his presence very close to the action at Shamor, because we can see in his account as a sworn witness to another person's statements uh, that he was there. So following the events at Shmore, by all accounts, the Crown Forces went on a burning and smashing rampage in the general area, tormenting families, burning houses. They forced all the shops in Carrick and Shannon to close. The Hall of Gal was burnt, as was the local creamery in Kiltahard, and all of the machinery was completely destroyed. And one of the private houses that actually was burnt in Carrick and Shannon was that of Jack Hunt's family. And Jack Hunt was among uh, the 11 men, man flying column. Uh, the following week at Selton Hill. So there are many documented accounts that after Shamor, uh, there followed a very heavy police and military presence in the whole south area of the county. And according to some of the military uh, archive witness statements, this actually hindered any further activity. But one week later, early on Friday, the 11th of March, Commandant Sean Connolly from Banley and Longford along with his 10 member active service unit or flying column arrived cross country uh, from Eslin Bridge to Selton Hill in Gorville. And they were Captain John Joe O'Reilly from Ochnashiel and Leitrim, Lieutenant John Joe O'Reilly from Ochnashiel and Leitrim. They were no relations. Seamus Wren from Riley Leitrim, Michael Baxter, Van Boy Count Cavan, Joe Byrne, Ornacula Leitrim, Jack Hunt, Carrick and Shannon Leitrim, Bernie Sweeney, Van Lamore, Andy McParkland, Ochnashilin Leitrim, P. McDermott, Van Lamore Leitrim, and my grandfather, Paddy Guckin, Drumsna. So the column had been walking since about 5 a.m. Uh, across country, rough terrain. They had stayed the previous night in Egan's house in Kurlaska, Eslin Bridge. So I'll just show you, this is the actual proximity of Eslin Bridge to Selton. So it was still morning. It was bitterly cold, but dry, and they were tired when they arrived at the house of James Flynn at Selton Hill. And Lieutenant John Joe O'Reilly was a first cousin of the Flynn's. And so they would have been welcomed to have food and to be able to rest there. So this is actually the Google Maps image of where Flynn's house is. The house is still there. Uh, and you can see the lane into it is the little grey line. So Flynn's house was and is located down a steep lane, uh, about 100 yards just off the main Mohul to Balnamore Road. Uh, and the house was in close proximity to the neighbor, nearest neighbours, the McCulloughs. And you can see McCulloughs, it's the kind of agricultural red uh, buildings that you can see. That's where their McCullough house would have been. And again, you can see the lane into it. So the McCulloughs were a Protestant family, and as the column had decided to rest for a few hours at Flynn's, it's believed that Connolly ordered the men in groups of uh, two to take turns staying with the McCulloughs as a precaution to their persuasion. Uh, my grandfather and P. McDermott were in McCulloughs from around 3 p.m. that evening. So it's worth mentioning that on the same day, the 11th of March, in the Dáil, we can see from the Oireachtas Dáil archive online that the president opened the Dáil session stating that there was one important question for them to decide after the reports were dealt with, and that was the acceptance of, I quote, full responsibility for the acts of the army. And he advised that he didn't think it was right that their men should appear to be in the position of working as irresponsible forces. And he thought it was absolutely necessary that the Dáil should let the world know that they took full responsibility for all the operations of their army. And that would practically mean a public acceptance of a state of war. And it was Leitrim's TD, James Dolan, speaking in favour of the declaration, said it was up to the Dáil to put the matter beyond yay or nay, and it should have been done long ago. 
and he also seconded the motion that was unanimously adopted. So in Flynn's house at Seltenham meal file uh, on the same day, the 11th, it's believed the column were in good spirits. These were young men. Uh, Commandant Sean Connolly and Joe Byrne were only just in their 30s, while Seamus Rin and Andy McParkland were 25. Uh, Bernie Sweeney was aged 24. Michael Baxter would have been 24 the following week. Jack Hunt and P. McDermott uh, were 23, while John, Lieutenant John Joe O'Reilly was 22, and Captain John Joe O'Reilly was the youngest at 21. My grandfather Paddy had turned 24 just over a week uh, before Selton, although I doubt the occasion would have been marked while on the run. So the commander Sean Connolly certainly had been scouting the area to find a suitable ambush site, uh, but I believe a decision hadn't been confirmed by the time they arrived at Selton. So the column had a few meals at Flynn's house, but as they rested and chatted and played cards, uh, their movements and their presence in the area became known. Now, there are many accounts as to how this happened, but most of them centre around another neighbouring family, the Latimers, and in particular, the head of that household, William Latimer. The Latimers were also a Protestant uh, family, and their house was just across the valley from Glynn's, so just outside of uh, that top left-hand corner of the image that you can see at the moment. So the Latimers would have had a view of the route the column had taken cross country approaching Blinds that morning. And some accounts say that William Latimer had seen Connolly and the other men arrive at Selton Hill. But William's mother had died the previous night or early that morning. And some accounts say that he sent his son or a young girl who worked for him over to the McCullough's house uh, to collect a few items for a week. And when they returned, uh, they mentioned there were strange men at the houses. There are also accounts that Sean Connolly over the course of the day was advised by local volunteers that his location was dangerous, uh, being so close to the two Protestant houses and also being down a slope off a main road uh, that Crown forces regularly used. Uh, and we know there is an account that a local Common Amman member uh, is said to have sent word to Connolly that the column's safety was in jeopardy because of careless talk in the local shop in Gora. But Sean Connolly uh, decided to remain. My grandfather never mentioned any warnings. But William Latimer, uh, the Protestant neighbour, had gone to Mohol to make arrangements for his mother's funeral. And somewhere en route, he was believed to have relayed the information on the location of the column to the local doctor, a Dr. Charles Pentland. Now, Dr. Pentland was ex-British Army, uh, and he in turn gave the information on the Flying Columns location to the RIC District Inspector, Thomas Gore Hickman, who was based in Mohol. And Gore Hickman, DI Gore Hickman, he notified the Crown Forces uh, military in Boyle, County Viscommon, where the British soldiers from the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiment were immediately dispatched. So sometime around four o'clock, uh, a gunshot was heard a distance away from Selton Hill, coming from the Mohol direction. And Sean Connolly asked Charlie Flynn, who had just arrived home from teaching uh, in the local school, to go up the lane to see if he could see anything. So this is the top of Flynn's lane. At the end of the lane, he walked up to, onto the main road. Uh, but before he even got uh, to the top of the hill, uh, he heard the lorries approaching. He heard the vehicles and he knew uh, the sound of the military lorry. And he waved back a warning to Connolly in the column below at his house. Uh, but he had very little time because almost immediately the military lorry pulled up at his neighbour's uh, lane. That's the McCullough lane you can see uh, in the middle of the picture. So Sean Connolly, he orders his men out to the back of Flynn's house. So the British soldiers, around 27 of them, they were well equipped. They quickly dismounted the lorry. The British officer in command, he deployed two sections with Lewis machine guns to cover the two laneways. One Lewis machine gun was set up on the top of McCullough's lane and one was set up on the top of Flynn's lane. Now these automatic weapons uh, were capable of firing around 600 rounds a minute. Uh, and had a range of over uh, 800 metres. 
So a section of British soldiers lined up for combat along the main road, covering north of Flins. Another section quickly maneuvered down McCullough's Lane, while a third section proceeded down Flynn's Lane with Charlie Flynn. So with these sections in place, and I suppose Selton Lock to the west, the British now were in a position to cover every possible route a fleeing column could take. So the, the Lewis machine gun fire started, and almost immediately the British soldiers uh, on McCullough's Lane on the south side of the main column opened up with rifle fire. Volunteer Jack Hunt, who was just returning from McCullough's, was caught in the open, shot and seriously wounded. And the other volunteers at Blinds, they tried to retaliate, but they didn't really stand a chance uh, and soon tried to retreat further back behind Blinds house. When Sean Connolly tried to move out from the cover of the house, he was hit a number of times by rifle fire and he was badly wounded. Volunteers Seamus Rin and Lieutenant John Joe O'Reilly tried to escape the deadly torrent of rifle fire from McCullough's Lane, but they were shot and killed. Volunteers Bernie Sweeney, Captain John Joe O'Reilly, Andy McParkland, Joe Byrne and Michael Baxter tried to escape lower down into the fields towards the northwest. Now this route was across open ground. The trees and hedges that you see in, in that image wouldn't have existed. Um, and therefore, they were open to the double threat of the Lewis gunfire as well as the rifle flyer uh, from the McCullough's Lane and the rifle fire from the main road. But there was no alternative because the two sections of British soldiers were advancing from the houses. Volunteers Joe Byrne and Michael Baxter were shot and fatally wounded. And Bernie Sweeney was shot a number of times. He fell into a drain uh, but remained conscious. Uh, and in his witness statement, he says that from his position, he could see uh, Captain John Joe O'Reilly preparing to throw a grenade, but he was shot simultaneously and the grenade exploded in his hand. Volunteer Andy McPartland was the only member of the main party to escape uninjured. He made his way uh, towards the main road and crawled along a low ditch uh, before eventually being a safe distance away. And he didn't seem to have been noticed by the British. My grandfather Paddy and P. McDermott found themselves in an awkward situation uh, in McCullough's because they were away from the commandant and the main group of the column. So they had to make their own decision as to what to do. So they decided their only option was to head for the lake. And having crawled as quickly as they could, they actually proceeded into the lake uh, and prepared for uh, full submersion should the British soldiers search the area for them. And Grandad had lost one of his leggings when he was crawling down the fields and he was sure that the British would spot it and therefore the route of escape would be identified. But luck was in his favour and in concentrating on the main body of volunteers, the British soldiers seemed to have forgotten their search of McCullough's. But in his position at the lake, Grandad seen his dead friend's bodies being dragged up the road to the army lorry and he said it was a sight that lived vividly in his memory. A search of the area by British soldiers failed to locate Bernie Sweeney. He was later rescued and although badly injured, uh, he made a full recovery. Jack Hunt, who was badly wounded, Charlie Flynn and Commandant Sean Connolly, who was mortally wounded, were placed under guard in the lorry with their dead comrades. And Sean Connolly died later that night in Carrick and Shannon Jail. On the night of the 11th of March, my great grandfather received news of the worst kind that his son had been shot dead at Selton Hill. And he went to Carrick and Shannon uh, Courthouse the next day to identify the body. All the dead were in a shed, uh, uncoffined in the yard, but he was refused entry and had to return home. And it was actually the following day before he heard the news that his son was unharmed and residing close by. On the basis that the British officers involved in Selton Hill shootings should not be identified, members of the press were not admitted to the British court inquiry at Carrick and Shannon the following Monday. But it found that no blame could be attributed to the Crown forces for the death of the six men. William Latimer, the Protestant neighbour, was shot dead at his home on the 30th of March. All my life, I've 
met people who've talked about Salton Hill and those young men and that tragic event on the 11th of March, 1921. Yet very rarely in the national context uh, or in any discussions nationally on the War of Independence, did I hear or see Salton Hill get a mention or relevant recognition. And I've read publications pertaining to be a national account of our country's War of Independence, where the events at Salton Hill get little and sometimes no mention at all. I think Cormac O'Sullivan, author of Leitrim's Republican Story, uh, put it best on the occasion of the 100th anniversary uh, this year, and he said, in the national context in the War of Independence, the six that were killed at Salton Hill was second only to Clonmult in County Cork in terms of casualties uh, in one day. So this was a significant event, not just in Leitrim's history. But Leitrim was fortunate that on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Salton Hill in 1971, a local man, Michael Whelan, undertook to commit the story to paper for the first time. And of course, more recently, among publications like Cormac O'Sullivan's Leitrim's Republican Story and Dr. Port McGarty's book, Leitrim, The Irish Revolution, 1912 to 23, um, these have added to the knowledge of events in Leitrim and particularly they have brought further recognition to the sad events at Selton Hill. And I suppose helped bring awareness of the loss at Selton Hill to a wider audience. And in March this year, uh, just before I sat down to construct my telling of the story of Selton Hill, I was delighted to see the fruits of a tremendous amount of work and commitment uh, by a local committee who mainly reside at Selton Hill today uh, when they produced and launched a commemorative book on Selton Hill for the 100th anniversary. And they also produced a short documentary and it's a great tribute to them. Uh, and especially to the book editor, Porrick Flynn, and committee member, Niall Flynn. And Niall is a family member from the original Flynn house. Uh, and of course, all the work that they had done helped make my job of telling the story tonight a lot easier too. And I highly recommend that you go to their website, seltonhill.com, if you want to know more or to buy uh, the book. And hopefully you do, and Selton Hill will get closer to the national recognition it should get. When I spoke to Regina last November about speaking at the summer school, I myself was in the process of producing and completing portraits of each of the 11 men who traveled to Selton Hill that day. And the portraits I was painting were to mark the occasion of the 100th anniversary. And I suppose it was my way of bringing the events at Selton Hill to a wider sphere and audience and, and trying to get further recognition uh, for those men. But working on the portraits, you know, I was surrounded by these 11 men's documented lives uh, with copies of any stories that were printed about them, any reference material I could find or any relevant documents that mentioned the men from the, the Bureau of Military Archives, along with uh, the very limited imagery or photos of each of the men so their lives and their images have been in my company, in my art studio for many, many months, you know, and often as I was working on the portraits, painting them or rereading the research, I'd have the radio on in the background and I'd hear the COVID news over the airwaves, round the clock, uh, COVID reporting and discussions, and I'd hear, you know, we are all in this together. We need to make sacrifices to save the lives of others. I mean, there were comments like, you know, your grandparents were called to war, you're being asked to stay at home on your couch. Uh, but call after call uh, during our COVID news that we all need to make sacrifices for the collective good. And I suppose these men of Selton Hill and their families understood sacrifices for the collective good. And I'm going to finish up uh, with each of the men's images. Uh, these are my completed portraits. Commandant Sean Connolly, fatally wounded. Joe Byrne, shot and killed. Michael Baxter, shot and killed. Captain John Joe O'Reilly, shot and killed. Lieutenant John Joe O'Reilly, shot and killed. Seamus Wynne, shot and killed. 
Jack Hunt, wounded. Andy McPartland, escaped. Bernie Sweeney, escaped. P. McDermott, escaped. And lucky for me, my grandfather, Paddy Gutkin, escaped. Thank you.